Melvi Broadcasting Network, a divine voice out of Africa. Remember to like, to subscribe and to click the bell. Good evening, camp meeting. I am so thrilled to be joining you tonight. I'm so happy to be here, my first time here, and um, really enjoy uh, the time we've had here and looking forward to meeting more of you. I'm going to get right into God's Word. Um, I, I, I kind of a no-nonsense type of preacher. So we're going to get right into this. Let me um, just open up my notes. We're gonna need, you're going to need your Bible. Um, and we're going to get right into this. Let me uh, read the scripture that I was given to preach on tonight. Uh, it is Micah chapter 7 and verse 8. Micah chapter 7 and verse 8. And you'll just want to turn your Bible to the book of Micah and leave it there because we're going to bounce around in it a little bit as well. So Micah chapter 7, starting at verse 8. I'll read in your hearing. The Bible says, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Our message tonight, based on Micah 7, 8, is entitled, When I Fail. When I Fail the laughter of mine enemies. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Lord, I ask once again that you make me just a nail upon the wall, a rusty, sorry nail, Lord. But upon that nail, Lord, I ask that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. Let Eric Walsh not be seen or heard tonight. Instead, Father, let us hear a word from the throne room of grace. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. The church say amen, amen. and amen. So we're going to come from the book of Micah. Um, Micah, like most of the Old Testament prophets, stood and looked out into the future. Micah was looking at what was about to be a, a, a cataclysmic shift in the normal order of Israel. Micah comes before Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel, but in many ways it's Micah, if you read the book carefully, who begins to actually give you, uh, give the uh, Israel its great warning and Judah its great warning as to what is going to happen and why. Micah is a poor a prophet. He, he comes from a, a farmland, a small a town. He, he's not a very complicated guy. He's a no-nonsense type of prophet who calls it like it is. And because of that, he goes through some things and, and he writes his book to match. He could see the end of the earthly kingdom of Israel. He warns the people of the conditions that they are in. But as you look carefully at this book, one of the things you come away with is that Micah is not simply writing to the Judah of his day. He's not simply writing to the Israel of his day. I want to submit to you as we go into this study that Micah is writing to us. And I will show you that as we unpack this thing, not only is Micah writing to the last generation that will be on earth, Micah is also uh, uh, warning us of what is to come while he is preparing us to stand strong. This is a book most pass over and pick up maybe two verses out of, I want to submit to you tonight that when we major in minor prophets, we often get major lessons. Micah 7, 8 is literally my favorite verse in the whole Bible. I have a few of them, but it's one of the favorite ones. And I'll tell you why, because I went through what uh, this verse is talking about and was able to come out the other side. You see, when I was in the pit 
when I was on every news station uh, in Los Angeles, when, I, when they were talking about me on CNN, when all of these things were happening, uh, there were certain Bible verses, certain passages that allowed me to see that God was on my side. Micah 7 and verse 8 is one of those passages. But you can't understand this verse in a vacuum. You need context to understand the text. So I want to start at Micah 7 and verse 1. And I want to read what it is that Micah's talking about. I want to set the stage, and then I'm going to go through and show you how, what, uh, how the parallels from what Micah's talking about then to our day today. Micah 7 and verse 1 says, Woe is me, for I am as when they have gathered the summer fruits as the grape leanings of the vintage. There is no cluster to eat. My soul desired the first ripe fruit. Now, commentarists say that this is in some ways an allegorical speech of Zion, of Israel, of Judah, of, of the people of God as they are supposed to be. That when uh, you look at Zion and Israel in the day, it is as if someone has gone through and uh, done the harvesting process and you've come afterwards looking for a piece of fruit. And as you come, there's nothing left. And what is the fruit? It is the fruit of the Spirit. It is the fruit that produces righteousness. As, as, as this woe is given, it is because among the people of God, none of the righteous are left. Verse 2, the good man is perished out of the earth. Listen to what he says here. And there is none upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net. Does it sound familiar? Verse 3, that they may do evil with both hands earnestly. The prince asks and the judge asks for a reward. And the great man, he utters his mischievous desire, so they wrap it up. Micah says, and remember, to be clear, Micah did not write this book to the pagan nations. He wrote this to the church of his day. Verse 4 says this, the best of them is as a briar. The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. The day of thy watchman and thy visitation cometh. Now shall be their perplexity. Trust ye not in a friend, Put ye not confidence in a guide. Watch this. Keep the doors of your mouth from her that lies in your bosom. The warning to the people of God is, listen, if you are one of those left after this harvest has taken place, after the fruit of righteous, those that are of the remnant have been stripped from the vineyard, if you are one of them, you best not trust a soul. Not even the one lying on your bosom. Huh. Verse 6. For the son dishonors the father. The daughter rises up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And then you get this, 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 this part of the verse that I love. It says here, it says, A man's enemies are the men of his own house. Have you heard that before? Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says the same thing. Why does Jesus say Jesus speaks to that as what is going to happen in a time of trouble related to what will happen before the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70? Micah says it in conjunction to what will happen in just a few generations in the fall of Jerusalem under the hand of Nebuchadnezzar uh, for, by the Babylonians. Let me submit something to you. They, are, they both said it then because if you don't learn what they should have learned then, you will succumb to what will happen now. Folk are going to turn on those who have decided to live for God. Amen. Let me tell you something. When I was going through my thing, it was challenging. I learned that people will flip like coins. I, can, I talk about some of this. I'll talk about the parts that were most public. Maybe I'll share some of the private stuff. This isn't my testimony, but again, the verse is my favorite verse because of what happened to me. And I remember when the, when the, when the article came out in the Pasadena Star newspaper, 
from our own denomination that said this man does not speak for us. They said this man is not ordained. And basically they said, listen, do whatever you, at least that's the way I read it. <laughs> let, me, let me clarify. Pers perspective is often reality to the one having the perspective. But to me it was, listen, do what you want with him, just don't attach us to him. I'll never forget, as all of the things began to unfold, how painful it was. And I remember, and I've never, I don't say this when I give the testimony, but, but I'll say it here. I remember being brought to the White Memorial Seventh-day Adventist Church. And all of the pastors of the conference were, were brought in. Higher ups in the denomination were brought in. And I remember them saying, listen, you're going to tell your side of the story and be able to explain to the pastors what happened. And I wasn't given a chance to speak. In fact, someone came and berated me publicly. I mean, it was, it was one of the most painful experiences I've ever had. What was most shocking to me was that there were some of the brethren who, <laughs> I, it was as if they had won the Santa Claus uh, 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 um, a lottery at Christmas. They were so happy at my demise. Some of them said, you're only getting what you deserve. I want to submit to you that it, we do not, we will, we will not simply, and are not, the truth is, this is what Sister White says, we're already going through it, we will not simply go through a shaking. It is more than that. We will go through a process where some who we thought were our friends will become our enemies. Amen. And the reason that that is so powerful is because if your faith is not properly anchored in God, you will not be able to stand. Because there's nothing quite like the ridicule of those who once stood for you. So Micah says it like this, because Micah experienced this. He went through this with some of the false prophets, just like Jeremiah did. Micah 7, verse 7 says, Therefore I will look unto the Lord, I will wait for the God of my salvation, my God will hear me. Micah's point, before we get to the main verse that we're going to discuss, Micah's point is, you cannot trust people. And let me tell you something. One of the things that happened after that incident and that article came out, I say this if you ever heard, heard, listened to my testimony, a brother called me and the brother said, listen, Dr. Walsh, after what the church did to you, he said, I'm not going to pay my tithe anymore. I said, brother, you know you ain't paid nobody no tithe in 20 years. <laughs> I said, I said, I said, listen, man, don't, I said, don't use me as no excuse not to give God what belongs to him. <laughs> you know, you got enough tithe right now to build a church from scratch that you ain't paid. <laughs> Somebody else called and said, listen, brother, I, I'm, I, I'm not going back to church after what they did. I'm done with them. I said, I'm not done with them. This is God's remnant church. This is the old ship Zion. And yes, it's going to hit some storms. It's going to rock and reel. At times, the ones who think they're at the helm are, might make some bad decisions, but it doesn't change which boat we're on. There are folk whose whole ministry is beating up our church. That's Satan's work. But at the same time, our trust isn't in organizations, it's in God. That's why he says, therefore, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. Micah's confidence is found in the last part of that verse. He says, God will hear me. There's no doubt, there's no question. You just heard a great message on faith. He stood in faith. God's going to hear me. 
And before that reason, we understand that this is a last day message. Before we go to verse 8, I want you to get that this message is a last day message. I can show you that this is a last day message. If you go to Micah chapter 1 and you start at verse 2, Micah 1, starting at verse 2, just flip back and look at Micah 1 and verse 2. Here's what the Bible says. Micah 1, 2 says, Hear all ye people, hearken, O earth, and all that therein is, and let the Lord God be witness against you. The Lord from his holy temple. For behold, here's, this is, yeah, what, what, look at what he's talking about here. For behold, the Lord comes forth out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. And the mountains shall be molten under him, and the valleys shall be cleft as wax before the fire, and as the waters that are poured down a steep place. Micah makes it clear. The real anticipation isn't the simple deliverance of the nation of Israel. It is a preparation for when God, he says, the Lord from his holy temple. Where is he going to come from? His holy temple. And where is he going to come out of? His place. Where is that place? I believe that this can also apply to Christ in the most holy place right now. He's going to come out of his place. The book of Revelation says he's going to come out and he's going to get on a white horse. He's going to take off his priestly robe and put on his kingly robe. And a sword is going to come out of his mouth. Heaven's going to be emptied out. This is a preparation for this, for the second coming of our Lord. So it's a last day event. Last day message. Look at this now. I'm going to show you how Micah hits the topics that are relevant to us today. He talks about false prophecy. Look at Micah chapter 3 and verse 5. Micah chapter 3, this little book is powerful. Micah chapter 3 and verse 5. Here's what he says. Micah 3 and verse 5. It says this. Thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that make my people err, that bite with their teeth and cry, peace. And he hath putteth not into their mouths, they even, uh, and, and he that putteth not into their mouths, they even prepare war against him. The false prophets make my people err. Now, if, if we had time, we'd go to the book of Revelation and we talk about the three unclean spirits that come out of the mouth of the dragon, the false prophet, and the beast that go out like frogs, these, 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 these um, uh, spirits that go out and deceive. And here's, what's, here's where the kicker is in all of that. As you look at it, uh, all of the three of them are tied back to false doctrine and spiritualism. I want to submit to you that when you look at what's going on today, Micah's pointing it out, why will you not be able to trust why will you have that whole path part of Micah 7, 1, before we get to verse 8? Why does it happen? Because the, the people who come after us, the Bible says, will believe that by persecuting us, they are doing God's work. How will you be convinced that you're doing God's work when you, what you're doing is antithetical to what God would have you do? It is because the spirit that is working in you is not the spirit of God, but the spirit of devils. Did you know that some of the mega churches in this country are not actually it's on the surface? They come across like they're very Christian, but if you're just careful and listen, one of the signs of who's really controlling some of those churches, listen to the sermons and ask yourself how many times they actually read a passage of Scripture. Don't get mad at me. One of the things that's going to happen is going to be false prophecy. There are going to be people who teach a prosperity gospel. Let me tell you something. I was shocked. I was at a large Adventist event. And a friend, someone I know, a friend of mine, was preaching. And he actually preached in the sermon. He said, um, speak. He said, if you want a Mercedes Benz, he said, go to the Mercedes Benz dealership and speak to the car. He said, if you want a house, Go to the neighborhood where the house is you want and speak to the house. I said, you better not come in front of my house with that foolishness. <laughs> there's a prosperity gospel. And let me tell you what it's tied up in. You see, there's this idea that was, it's the same, it was deep, it is the same 
<laughs> false theologic doctrine that was permissive for Micah, Jeremiah, and even among the disciples before they were converted. The idea that there must be a kingdom on earth now. U.S. foreign policy, and I know I've worked in the government, U.S. foreign policy is in part based on this false doctrine that Israel must be restored to, its, to the divinic kingdom in order for Jesus to return. When Donald Trump moved the, the, the U.S. embassy from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, people in this country cheered and shouted, the third temple is going to be built. This is a false doctrine. It's False prophecy that lays all end time events right where they laid it in Micah's day, just like they did for Jeremiah. They told Jeremiah, there's no way God would do what you're saying. He's got to have a house. When Jesus turned over the tables in Matthew chapter 23, the disciples were shocked when he left and said, I leave your house unto you desolate. Ichabod, the glory has departed. And yet, folk today, don't believe Jesus when he said he left it desolate. End time. And because of that, folk are going to be looking to the earth for the answers rather than looking to the kingdom that is heavenly and eternal. The second one, another great end time uh, issue that Micah brings up, Micah chapter 2 and verse 11. It says, if a man walking in the spirit uh, walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie saying I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink he shall even be the prophet of this people there's this verse that says that there are going to be people walking around lying and they will, they will prophesy of wine and strong drink and that that is the type of mindset the people will choose now, how is this coming to pass? Let me tell you something. I'm a, I'm a medical doctor, and I'm telling you, some of the stuff I'm seeing is crazy. The massive legalization of marijuana is one of the signs of the end. And let me tell you something. I, I don't mean that from a political standpoint, because you can argue politics all day. What I'm saying is there is a massive experiment being done on the minds of Americans that you can smoke marijuana that is literally 10 times more potent than the marijuana Bob Dylan and Bob Marley smoked. Some of y'all laughing. I ain't supposed to know about Bob Marley and Bob Dylan smoking that stuff. <laughs> 10 times. There was 3% THC, tetrahydrocannabinoid back then. It's 30% now. So potent that you can be driving on the highway in your car with the windows up in the winter with the heat on and drive past the car where they're smoking it and on the highway at 65, 70 miles an hour, you smell weed. If it can perme permeate the walls and glasses, uh, the, the doors and glasses of cars and cross highway lanes, what is it doing to people's brains? And here's where they're going. I want you to listen carefully to what you're talking about. What they're talking about. When Sanjay Gupta did his whole special on marijuana, what he, what he was pushing was this medical marijuana. Listen, this is what has been going on forever. They did it with cigarettes. They did it with sugar. They've done it with everything. They tell you, oh, this thing is good for you, and they, they lie that a poison is good for you to get you to get into it. I, I, if I had time, I'd show you all, I, you know, normally in my talks, I'll show you the slides of the, when they said four out of five doctors recommend camel cigarettes for your anxiety. Watch this. Satan is taking it up a notch to something called psychedelics. You're going to begin to hear them talking about how they can open up your mind and change things. And what is actually happening, church, is that they are setting people up. Micah talked about this way back then. It's, it's the connection between mind-altering substances and spiritual uh, involvement. Some of you I know are familiar with Jamaica and Rastafarianism and Rastafarianism is a global phenomenon now. But one of the reasons the dread says that they smoke weed is because it brings them closer to God. It's not our God. In fact, I remember I was, I was, at, I was at Bob Marley's house. Our family's friends with Bob Marley's family, and I was at his house, and I was talking to one of his, I think one of his brothers or one of the dreads there were trying to explain to me why I should smoke weed. And I said, listen, if you can show me from the Bible why I should smoke weed, he said, I can show you from the Bible why you should smoke weed. 
He said, he flips his Bible to the book of Exodus, throws his dreads back. He said, you're not seeing out the book of Exodus. <laughs> As Moses approached the burning bush. <laughs> Same get to talk to God. <laughs> Listen, church. People are so void of God. God has been so effectively removed from our society. People have no longer have purpose that they are willing to use what they think is a spiritual accelerant to get to know the spiritual world. But what they don't understand is in the warnings the spirit of prophecy gives about hypnosis, what we're finding out is that in fact what they're exposing themselves to are chemical hypnotic agents. And the reason when you go to a liquor store, they say spirits sold here is because when you begin to tamper with your uh, 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 sobriety, when you remove the protective layer, the enemy can grab hold of your brain. And watch this. The Bible does not say that your brain is to be opened. It does not say that your mind is to be released. In fact, instead it says God is going to put a seal on your mind. Revelation 7, 1 through 3 says, you're going to get a seal right here in your forehead. Why? Because this is the 33% of their brain is frontal lobe. It is what makes us human, what makes us able to worship. It is what gives us the ability to have a character. And what we've learned is that the chemicals in these things, especially alcohol and marijuana, literally erase the GABAergic system in the brain. GABA is the one that causes you to be constrained. So uh, when you release it, it, you release, you can't control yourself. The Bible says that it is the love of Christ that constraineth us. I believe that the frontal lobe is like the most holy place in your body temple. And if you let this stuff in there, you'll go far away from God because you'll let everything but his Shekinah glory or the Holy Spirit in. The third one, if you're looking at last day things, is sexual sin. Micah says this, Micah 6, 5 through 8 says this, O oh, my people, remember how that Balak king of Moab consulted and what Balaam the, Balaam the son of Beor answered him from Shittim unto Gilgal, that ye may know the righteousness of the Lord. If you remember that story that he's referring, Mike is referring to here, this is when uh, Balaam came and told Balak how to take the protection from God's people. In just, in Numbers chapter 23, it says that there was no perversion in Israel. Two chapters later, God is almost done with them. It, it is this sin as they're on the precipice of the promised land that causes them not to enter the promised land and instead they wander for 40 years. You know what did that? Sexual sin. Micah's warning them. And let me show you how deep this thing gets. Let me finish reading this. I'm going to show you how deep this thing gets. Verse 6, wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the, the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Then he says, he hath showed you, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee? Three things. But to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. I bet most people read verse 8 in all by itself. It's great. You go to um, the Christian bookstores and they got plaques with that verse on it. Understand that that verse is in the context of verse 5, which is speaking a primarily a warning around the sexual sin that caused Israel to have to wander for 40 years. Wow. So in other words, the antithesis to sexual sin, at least in one way, is to do justice, to love mercy. And probably the part that really hits it is the last part, which says, walk humbly with your God. You see, pride is where sexual sin lives. That's where it lives. So when Micah begins to warn about sexual sin, he says, listen, if you want to do right, you need to walk humbly, not in pride. Now watch this. You don't think I'm telling you the truth. Look at Ezekiel chapter 16. 
I'll just read it because I don't, I don't have a lot of time. Ezekiel chapter 16, 49 and 50. Ezekiel 16, 49 and 50 says this. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. What was the sin of Sodom? Watch this. Number one, pride. That's what the Bible says. Pride. Fullness of bread. An abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. That is the condition of America. Pride. Fullness of bread. Abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. That's why, verse 50 says, they were haughty, they were arrogant, and committed abomination before me. God says, therefore, I took them away as I saw good. Sexual sin. You see what happens in sexual sin is that there is a natural release of dopamine. The same thing cocaine releases, the highest natural level is during uh, intimacy. And so it's released, and so it, is, it, it can get you high. That's why people can become addicted to it. But it's also an adrenaline rush. And there's a whole bunch of excitement. In fact, it, in, in essence, it is a way to intoxicate naturally. This is why God reserved that for inside the institution of marriage, so that when the bond between husband and wife was formed in the presence of dopamine, in the presence of pheromones, in the presence of all of the adrenaline that's released, in the presence of the binding hormone oxytocin, that marriage, as they looked into each other's eyes on the night of their honeymoon or short after, they, they would bond not just in, in a legal matrimony, they would physically become one flesh. So now when society tells our young people to bounce around and sleep with everything that moves, spend all the time you want in a no-tell motel, literally it is peeling back the sensibilities of this generation. Micah's warning, in the last days, that is going to be a serious problem. One of the other ones he talks about is the destruction of the poor. We mentioned that in Ezekiel 16 as well. I won't get into that one. I'll skip it. But I want to tell you that this a society that allows people to suffer. And, and see, the thing about poverty is people don't want to admit it, but we, 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 we have literally designed our society to have some of its poverty because we have belittled the nuclear family. If you destroy the family, it is one of the surest ways to allow people to actually have. I have time to get into that tonight. But they, the destruction of the family, the, the, the ignoring the poor, all of that is a part of what Micah is talking about. So Micah 7, verse 7 again. Now we can get to verse 8. It'll make more sense. Therefore, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. So after he says, listen, you got to be careful. The people are going to turn on you. Don't even trust the person in your bosom. All of the things that Micah says. He says, my God will hear me. Then he gets to the verse of the night. He says, rejoice not against me. O mine enemy, when I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Let me tell you something, when, I, when this verse really came to mean something to me, I was just going through so much. The state of Georgia, after everything happened to me in Pasadena, I don't have time to get into the details, so uh, I just have to skip to the part here. Um, but with the state of Georgia, I'd landed at JFK or LaGuardia to speak for, um, for a youth federation. I, I'd, I'd had to, I, I was pressured to give up my job in Pasadena because of my sermons that had been found by some of the students. I'd been asked to speak at a college for their commencement. Um, they were upset that the guy who was invited was disinvited, and so they came after me. And I, I was pressured to give up that, that job, a job I, I did, was well, did well at and loved. I'd already started applying for another job, so the state of Georgia had already offered me a job and I said, look how God works. I can run from the blue state to the red state, and maybe I'll be safe. <laughs> but remember what the Bible says. Your trust can't be in people or political parties. Don't trust anybody. You trust the Lord God. 
I landed at JFK or LaGuardia, wherever it was in New York, I, whichever one I, in New York I landed, and the state of Georgia left a message on my phone while I was flying telling me that I was no longer hired for that job. They didn't give a reason on the phone. They were like, we're very sorry, Dr. Walsh, you can't work here, blah, blah, whatever they said. They thought they hung up the phone, but they didn't. And I could hear them laughing and mocking me in the background. When I finally got to my um, religious liberty attorneys and I played them that tape, that, that voice message, I should say, they high-fived. And I said, that was a very painful message. I'm not sure why you're celebrating it. They said, because every case we take, and this is First Liberty Institute out of Dallas, Texas, they said, every case we take, God shows us up front a piece of evidence that ensures us we assures us we will win the case. Ha! It was literally the laughter of my enemies that allowed me to take to that fight. Church, I can't even tell you how painful it was at times. It would take a week for me to just explain the amount of pain I experienced, how much loss I went through. But somebody sent me this verse. Someone texted me this verse, and I read the verse, and I remembered in that moment, I've got to have a faith in God that allows me to stand even when my enemy begins to mock me. If the world loves you, you're doing something wrong. The world accepts you. It is because your Christianity is not on full display. And I know that it's not in everybody's key situation just yet. But that day is coming. Yeah. Jeremiah says, listen, if you can't keep up with the footmen, how are you going to run with the horses? You can't. Listen, we got folk now can't keep the Sabbath. Every week they, they ox fall in the ditch. They, 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 they got some ditch-dwelling ox every Sabbath. They got to be in the store picking up something. If, if, listen, if right now keeping the Sabbath is just an arbitrary thing, you think when your livelihood is on the line, when your life is in jeopardy, when your freedom is at risk, you think all of a sudden you're going to stop going to the store and picking up pantyhose on the Sabbath? Let me tell you something. This is a message of great hope. He says, rejoice not against me. That's the text for tonight. Oh, mine enemy, when I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. And let me tell you something. You know what I learned? God allows us. He allowed me. He sent me into that darkness. Let me not even say he allowed me. He sent me. You know why? Because I needed to see his light. I was too caught up in career. Let me tell you something, I wasn't innocent in the whole thing. It was work God needed to do on Eric Walsh. And so God allowed me to go through some stuff so that at the end of it, I would be a better mouthpiece for him. I would be more secure in him. He allowed me to pass through the fiery furnace because I, I learned a lesson. You do not get to meet Jesus if you can figure out a way to not step into the fiery furnace. You only meet him in the fire. Yeah, folk, they doing everything to stay out of that fire. Look at what he says. Look at, I'm now, now look at how Micah makes this thing clear. Micah 7 and verse 9 says this, I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he plead my cause and execute judgment for me. He will bring me forth to the light and I shall behold his righteousness. Micah says, listen, whatever it is, Israel, that we've got to go through, we're the ones who sinned. We deserve it. So he said, I'll bear the indignation of the Lord until he plead my cause. Watch this. Even the investigative judgment is in it. He says, and he execute judgment for me. Did you get that? See, folk are afraid of the judgment. They don't, because they don't understand the judgment. You see, the investigative judgment is for the righteous. When Jesus returns, he says, lo, I come, and, and, I, and my reward is what? It's with me. 
some, he, has to, he has to go through and execute judgment to determine who gets a reward. The trials, somebody needs to hear this, the trial that you're going through right now is God lining you up for your reward. Listen to what the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary says. Listen to this. It says on this verse, it says, I will bear. This is the language of the truly penitent. He realizes that his only hope is in God. He asks for no mitigation of punishment. He knows that whatever God does will be for his good. Did you get that? God was working on me. And when I give the testimony, the full testimony, I say, I say, listen, God allowed that trial to go through me, to, to, for me to go through that trial so that the trial could go through me. You see, the problem, I've learned it. I say this all the time when I give that testimony. I say, the problem isn't the trial. The problem isn't the storm. There's a song we all used to sing in, 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 back in MV and, and AY back when we were kids. And JMV, some of y'all remember that too. There's a song we used to sing, say, with Jesus in the vessel, you can smile at the storm. Did you get that? That's a lesson they gave us as children that many of us forget as adults. The problem isn't the storm. It's whether or not you got Jesus in your vessel. Because if Jesus is in your heart, it doesn't matter what storm comes. The disciples were afraid when the storm came in there on the ship, but they didn't understand. The ship actually couldn't sink if Jesus was in it. I came to tell you, your ship cannot sink if Christ is in it. Even death is but a power nap for the Christian. Here's what the spirit of prophecy says. We are to grow daily in spiritual loveliness. This is from God's Amazing Grace, page 302. We are to grow daily in spiritual loveliness. We shall fail often in our efforts to copy the divine pattern. We shall often have to bow down to weep at the feet of Jesus because of our shortcomings and mistakes. But we are not to be discouraged. We are to pray more fervently, believe more fully, and try again with more steadfastness to grow into the likeness of our Lord. As we, as we distrust our own power, we shall trust the power of our Redeemer and render praise to God who is the health of our countenance and our God. Distrust self. She says, by beholding, we are to become changed. That's what a song, it's funny, I, I wanted my wife to sing before, and that's literally the song she would have sang. That Pastor Lord King just sang, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Why is that so important? You see, if you only spend your time looking at your past, looking at your failures, looking at all of the mistakes you made, if that's what you spend your time doing, that's what you will become like. Satan wants to remind you of your past. He wants to be your adversary and do that because the more you focus on what you've done wrong, the more you become like what you did wrong. It is not until you turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face that the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. As you look at Christ, you become like Christ. Don't sit there and mope in your sin. Spend that time in the word of God reading the Gospels, studying the book, The Desire of Ages. Come to know Jesus for yourself completely. The more you study him, the more you'll want to be like him. The more the Holy Spirit will give you power to be like him. She says, it is by faith in the Son of God that transformation takes place in the character and the child of wrath becomes the child of God. Look at Jesus. Why? Because he's getting the people ready for the second coming. Micah 2, 12 and 13 says this, I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel, the remnant. I will put them together as the sheep of Basra, as the flock in the midst of their fold. Micah 2, 12, uh, they shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. The breaker is come up before them and they have broken up and have passed through the gate and are gone out by it. Watch this. Then it says, and their king shall pass before them 
and the Lord on the head of them. There is a remnant that is being assembled. A last day group of people who will face the time of trouble. Characters being perfected. So powerful that in Micah 5, 2 is where he prophesies of Jesus is coming. And he calls him, look what he says, Micah 5, 2. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee uh, shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. Verse 4, and he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord our God, and they shall abide. For now he shall be great it unto the ends of the earth. This is prophecy telling you that Jesus is going to come the first time and he's coming back the second time and he's coming back for you and I. <laughs> Micah 4.1. Micah 4.1 says this, but in the last days it shall come to pass. I tell you, this book is about, the, this little book is telling you about the last days. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall, many nations shall come and say, come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. This is like the loud cry. We're being prepared to give a loud cry. A time is coming when the nations of the world are going to come. And right now it may seem impossible for it to happen. I remember when we thought it would, we would never see uh, the Soviet Union evangelized. We are going to see things happen to get the gospel to spread around the world, and we are to be participants with Christ in that work. That's why we're going through trial now. Micah 7, 18 says this. Micah 7, verse 18. Who is a God like unto thee that pardons iniquity? passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. Did you get that? He's going to pass by the transgression of his remnant. You see, that book of works is going to, those sins were going to be blotted out. The sins on the page that says Eric Wallen, it must be a whole lot of pages. But guess what? If I am in Christ Jesus, his blood will blot out those sins. When I stand before him in judgment and my life plays on the giant screen, and the screen, when it comes time to show my sin, will go blood red. My father, I have covered his sin with my blood. I have paid the price for his iniquity. Ah, he says, he retaineth not his anger forever. Why doesn't he not retain his anger forever? Because he delights in mercy. Verse 19, he will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. You know what I like about that verse? One, your sin is cast into the depths of the sea. Man has been to the moon. Man has landed stuff on Mars. Man has never been to the very bottom of the ocean. Your sin has been taken and cast into the depths of the sea. And guess what? You do not need to go and buy deep sea diving gear and go looking for it. If God has forgotten it, you have permission to forget it as well. To cast our sins into the sea of forgetfulness. SDA Bible commentary on this says this. The key verse I want to leave you with is this. The part in that verse where it says, he will subdue our iniquities. This is the process of sanctification. Iniquity is repetitive, uh, habitual type sin. He says he will subdue it. That means character growth. That means habits will be shaken off. A lot of folk will say, you know, you can't preach perfectionism. But you know what? You, you must preach perfection of character. Moses made mistakes almost all the way up to the end of his life, but his character was right with God. It was perfect with God. So much so that Michael the archangel, Jude tells us, Jesus himself goes back and retrieves his body from his grave. Subdue our iniquities. Israel iniquities, which it had been, this is from the SDA Bible commentary on verse, on verse 19. 
Israel's iniquities, which had, it had been Micah's sad lot to expose, would be freely forgiven. Though here not particularly pointed out, pardon was only on the basis of thorough repentance and reformation. The discipline of the captivity was designed to affect such a spiritual revival. This was not achieved on a national scale, and so the glorious promises with which Micah closes his prophecies were never realized by the nation of Israel, and never will be in the way that many think. Here's what it says. Individuals, of course, experience the saving grace of God and obtain the pardon here promised. The blessings may also be claimed by the Christian. Here's what the SDA Bible Commentary says. Through the merits of the grace of Christ, his sins may be perfectly forgiven. If he endures till the end, his sins will never be mentioned against him again. Should he apostatize and be lost, all his sins will face him on the judgment day. Let me tell you something, church. There was a night when I had to flee this country and I went to the, the little island of Guam to be a missionary. One of the Friday nights, the, 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 the missionaries were having worship and I was, I didn't tend, I stayed home and just did worship by myself. I got through my trial, if you hear me give the testimony, through prayer, praise, and the Psalms. Those are the three Ps of my deliverance. And I stayed back and I was reading and I began to pray. And I was mad at God. I said, Lord, look what I've lost. Look at how much I've had to give up. Look at all the people who used to respect me. I was mad at God. God began to remind me of all the times he passed my exams in school. He reminded me all the times he paid my tuition. He remi God began to show me all of that. And he began to show me that he was the one who got me the job in the first place. And when I opened my mouth to complain, the only thing that came out, church, was I'm unworthy. I'm unworthy. I'm unworthy. And as I began to look at my past and I began to survey all the ways that I had failed God, even just in the time just before my trial, I began to realize God was exercising mercy on me. And in that moment, I realized my enemies cannot rejoice because God is my light. Amen. Amen.